Tonight, we experience the character and soul of St. Lucia. Over the next few minutes, you will see and hear what defines and what makes us unique, what shaped us as a people, what were we passionate about, and how did we communicate. Our music told you exactly who we were, what rhythms we danced to, and what was our worldview. Tonight, we define St. Lucia through the groundbreaking writings of Goth St. Omer, the first St. Lucian to publish a novel that gained international recognition and probably the most versatile and most prolific songwriter in St. Lucia. We're talking about Charles Cadet. You will experience his brilliance tonight. And our folk music has never been the same since Ramo Polio took up that violin and created a sound that is uniquely St. Lucian. Then there is dance and the commitment and dedication of Virgie Alexander. Also tonight, you will experience the creativity and brilliance of sculptor Vincent Joseph Udovic and Arthur Jacobs, the actor's actor. Theatre was never the same after he walked on stage. You're watching my eyes to see if they will rain. I'll cry but in the privacy of my own tent. Six cultural icons in one night to remember. Tonight, we begin with Charles Cadet. But before we get to his tribute, we have a burning question. Is Barbara Cadet related to Charles Cadet? Think about it for a moment. It's a question we put to Barbara Cadet. <laughs> I've always known of Charles Cadet. He's actually my mother's cousin, so I guess that makes me his grand cousin or something like that. A lot of people think he's my father. One of the first most impactful uh, pieces, songs of his is Poinsettia Blossoms. And that was so popular and such a big song at, at that time. I think that even then I realized that he wasn't just, you know, this ordinary guy. This thing was all over the radio, especially at Christmas time. So I knew that he was something special. Ginger soaking for the ginger beer. Rich red bottled waiting there. From my generation, Charles Kelly was, um, he was, he was a part of everybody's Christmas. Um, I, that one song, Points of the Blossoms, I remember I was, I was taught that song in primary school, so that, and that was a long time ago. Ginger soaking for the ginger beer. Rich red sorrow bottled waiting there. Punches, punches, cloves and spices there. Carbon lanterns, scenes of yesteryear. I used to perform at a place called Bitter End. The young fellow with his guitar, and I'd just done. Uh, points at the blossoms. I heard Lenny sing a nice. I knew immediately that was a voice I wanted to record. Points at the blossoms. You know. And then he went to England, and while he was up there, he told me to come up. He would send a ticket for me so we can record Points at the Blossom because when we wrote that, True Tones was doing an, an album at the same time, so we gave the song to True Tones. So while he was up there, he took the opportunity to ask me to come up, and we did that. 
tell her of my love Bring her back to me Even now, you know, people in the diaspora would call me and they, that's the first thing they would mention about that particular song. And that was the beginning of, of CAS, which is our label, Cadian Stone. Maybe tomorrow we will see, but no, your actions speak to me. Your lips are cold, I've been told. But I can simply turn, turn away from you. We work with Roddy, Roddy Walcott. We work with Joyce Ogis, Clement Springer. We work for Robert Lee, John Robert Lee. We work for McDonald Dixon. We did a lot of, every Sunday we would meet and whatever he has, we would just go through the lyrics and um, build that music together. But now it seems all history What happens to that chemistry That made it touch his kiss alive Lyrically, he's much, much better than me. But I was able to work with him through my knowledge of of the music. I play by air and I, you know, I don't write. Most of the music we, we did together, he had to go to people like Piper and Carlos Mins to write it down. Springer used to be there with us at one time, Clement Springer. Actually, my um, association with Charles goes back many, many, many years. As a young bandsman, just in my early days, in the police band, that would have been mid-70s. Uh, Charles and the, the then director, Carlos Mins, were very good friends, actually. Carlos Mins is the one who arranged and notated, if not all, most of Charles's music. And I had a very, as a young bandsman, I had a very close association with my director. I sometimes scored music for him as well. So that whole association with Charles and Carlos means um, I sort of got involved. So I've been associated with Charles's music from a very young, very young bandsman. The Lamb of God, which I had to teach the choir, his Lamb of God was another challenge. Very difficult piece. He was a very stern, uh, no nonsense person who didn't compromise. He knew what he wanted. And like most composers who really know what they want, there's no compromising. Just go.
is further testimony of the superlative quality of Charles Cuddy's sacred music. He did everything. He did folk. It was a country song on that on that CD. There was like just a, such a, a fast range of genres, you know. Religious music he did, he did a mass, he did a requiem, you know, so, so much. Look around you, Tom. There are so many things you can ask yourself. Why not begin right now and ask some things like this? The classical piece, The Power of Learning, from the legend of Tom Fool by um, Roddy Walcott. Our heart should first be yearning to seek the power of learning. I'll find the cause for everything to satisfy my questioning. What makes a tiny seedling grow into a mighty tree? Early to mid 90s, I was approached by Pat Charles of CDF um, to document the musicals of Roddy Walcott for which Charles had done the music. It was a big, you know, project. And um, we started working together very, very, very closely, you know, several days a week into the night. And because there were five musicals, and the project was to not only record. The, the pieces and songs as they should be. It was also to document the scores, have the scores available, having the back, backing tracks available so that should anyone want to put on one of these musicals, they could just go to CDF, they could get the, the full thing of what it should sound like, they could get the scores if they wanted musicians to play them live, or they could also get the backing tracks if they wanted to do that as well. They before the wolf finds out what your establishment is all about. Having lived in England for a long time and being exposed to all of those plays, those musicals, you know, at the Royal Albert Hall, which he also had a performance done there as well of his work. So, um, he, he would have the melodies, but he would give me a lot of, of scope for interpretation in terms of the, the, the instrumentation, but he very much directed it. I learned of his music in school, I mean, in, in primary school. You know, really primary and secondary school, we, you know, we would sing some of his music and so forth. So things like Papa Odu and Estefan, clearly the folk aspects of what he did um, left an indelible mark on me. I could remember them from a very young age. I to do What I thought was unique about his music was that it, was, it, was, it had this wonderful rhythmic, rhythmic celebratory sort of content, but, it, but the storytelling was very profound and, um, and in terms of the music and so forth. Um, and it, it very, he was a very good storyteller musically, so it, I found his music very memorable. Ay, 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 do, do, pa plewe kosa, pa plewe kosa, u kai kwaze jemwe. I do do, pa plewe 
I think he'll always be known for Banjo Man. He will always be known for Banjo Man. Banjo Man will always live on. Um, everybody knows it. It's one of our most well known folk songs. Influenced by the classics, he was influenced by you know, he, you know, he, his expression of folk was not in a vacuum, you know, it was within a worldly context, and he brought all of those experiences into his music, um, and he was fiercely passionate about our and proud of our, our culture and um, the beauty of our culture. often lamented that he didn't receive, he didn't have formal training, but he was so gifted, he had, he could hear arrangements, you know, very complex arrangements in his, in his head, and, and he was very meticulous about what he wanted to hear. So the thing was, how do you work with him to get those ideas outside of his head? That was, it was so painful as well, um, in that he didn't study music, he was a fabulous tenor for many years, and, um, but he never studied music in terms of scoring and, and really how to play an instrument so there was a lot of uh, grief I would say especially later in his life that that he he couldn't do that for himself he couldn't sit at the piano you know if he did it was very elementary he should have really learned an instrument because you know he would do a lot more because he had to depend on me a lot with you know all the chords were in his head, but he couldn't bring it out, so I had to bring it out for him. And that's how it was easy for him to, to work. I thought, you know, that, you, you know, as getting old, you can't remember anything, so I thought I'd put it down the paper. But, but then, you know, in this light, I can't read it. <laughs> This has been a wonderful evening for me. You know, a nostalgic one, you know, as I remember the occasions on which we, I did some of this music. What I w wanted to, 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 to say here is how I miss Roddy Walcott. I mean, I'm, so much of, of the music heard today, tonight comes from the plays that, uh, that he wrote, you know. And uh, I was privileged to write music for them. Uh, you know, Roddy, Roddy resided in, 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 in Canada, but his heart was always in St. Lucia. You know, his soul was always in St. Lucia. The, the plays that he wrote, the soul was in St. Lucia. But you know, St. Lucia did not always reciprocate that love that Roddy had. And um, a lot of times, he was promised things that never materialized. I'm hoping tonight's uh, event, uh, which sees me here, means that things are changing. But, you know, <laughs> and at the same time, I thought of people like Carlos Mins. Carlos, who was a, you know, a brilliant teller. Yeah. You know, very brilliant, 
musician, you know. He did so much to bring the police band to the excellence that it is today, you know. You know? And what I have to do now, I think, is to thank the hard-working staff of the CDF who have worked like anything to put this on. Under, under tremendously difficult circumstances, you know, uh, putting on a show like that isn't easy. And you, 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 you probably get a lot of hell while you're doing it, but then when it comes off the way that it has come off tonight, it's delightful. I've enjoyed it, that is what it's all about, and I'm sure that you have enjoyed it too. Piper has done so much for me. You see, I, you're an old friend, you forget friends. We continue with music. From a singer, songwriter, to an instrumentalist. Ramo Polio became a folk legend because of his mastery of the violin. He defined the tone of original folk music in St. Lucia. I was aware of him from when I was a little girl. My dad was very much into history and culture and I remember him always talking about this violinist from from, he, he's from Viewforts, from Bellevue, he used to say. And um, I, you know, in those days, we didn't have all the things that we have now where you could easily tape stuff. And at the time, everybody just knew he was a great violinist. And I think my dad also said that um, he also used to play the quattro before he played the violin. And he was just one of those people who played music by ear. He could just listen to something and just play it. Our community, I should say, our community in the time of Creole, this is one of the biggest community of culture in St. Lucia. When it comes to music, this is the actual background of music, cultural music of St. Lucia. Tensa. Speed up. The tribute itself just says to me that these musicians and that our culture and um, everything that surrounds it is not forgotten. So I used to go out with Ramo, listen to him, love his style, playing unique, the way he held his bow. Not scratchy, but plain. You could hear the sound come out neat. And I said, this is very good. Why shouldn't I emulate that? One of the nicest evenings I've ever had in terms of honoring a cultural icon. And I was so happy that it was done in his hometown. Um, 
It was, it just had so much meaning. You looked around and you could see that the people who were there were full of pride. What was a real joy for me was to see the younger generation playing with Ramo, playing Ramo's songs. Because you know a musician will always be a musician. When you hear music, your fingers will ache you. And you can see in his eyes that what he was doing before, he's unable to do it now. And he's aching to see if he can join to continue it. Because the passion of he had for the culture, it remains with him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why they used to call him the Mappy P, Ramopoleon. I think he has played a tremendous role in bringing cultural music and folk music to the forefront. When you heard about folk music, you heard about Ramopoleon and Cesar and Descai. And these two were the only names you heard. And they consistently did music and played music. They never stopped, nothing deterred them, even if there were not a bunch of people doing it, they believed. And you can feel that in when they sing and when Sesen sings and when Ramopolio plays, you can feel that energy. You can feel that this is not just something I'm doing. This is something I love. And this is something that means something to me. And for me, this is just something that all young people who are musicians could look up to and take that into consideration when you do music. I think that we need to start teaching the violin 
to kids from, the ver from very young. They are kids who have an aptitude for learning musical instruments. They have, they just have this joy. And I mean, I would not say that the music is dead. I would say that it needs a lot more work where generations like mine can actually push it and make it sexy for the young people. My grandfather used to play violin, I remember very well. He, te he tell me, he told me he used to, he learned to play the violin on a string on the, house, on, the, on the board on the house. And that is exactly how he was showing me how to play it. He tied the string to the, to the board tightly and you, know, you feel because the violin has no frets. So you have to feel the notes. When I was selected to do this tribute to Ramapoya, I was happy for many reasons. It brought me back to Bellevue, which is where he was born and my family, a lot of my family still live there. And I um, was happy to go back there and get a sense of everything, of the culture that I grew up understanding and I grew up in. And for me, it was just an honor to be able to sing his music. I think everybody knows that he is like the, they call him Papa Kilti. He is like the 
grandfather of our music. He, and he has a way of only playing. It's almost like perfection. He, he wants perfection. And he's just one of those people that a lot of other musicians looked up to as the person that they could emulate in terms of the violin. And um, he was always very gracious in terms of wherever people wanted him to play and so on. And I think he did one or two tours for St. Lucia. I'm not sure, I'm not absolutely sure about that. All I remember is go making sure that wherever Ramo played, I wanted to be. He has, you know, every musician has their own kind of feel, their own kind of touch, their own kind of sound. Ramo had his own kind of sound, his own kind of talent on, on the, he used to make the violin speak. The people were energetic. I mean, it was crowded that night and every song we sang, because it was a group of ladies, and every song we sang, they sang with us. They knew it, they danced, and it, it was truly amazing to be on stage and get that kind of reception for music that was done so long ago and that people still appreciated and that you were on stage bringing it out to them and helping them remember this song, remember who sang that, and Ramo Polio, and you know, just knowing that he appreciated what you were doing because you were really honoring him and saying thank you for your music. So, you know, the legacy goes on and everybody from the community embraces it. Everybody knows it. It's a pity that well, the music is still not alive now, it's not going on, you understand? So, but the community love it. What is your sorrow for hyping shows? How is that? When we hit my view, all I'm around, let's not even show that. Let's take a break from the music for a bit to focus on a literary icon, Garth St. Omer. He was an educator as well as a writer. He was the first St. Lucian to publish a novel that gained international recognition. His early years were influenced by colonial education. His writings were rebellion against that influence. I think I'll write a novel called Shades of Grey. My first character will be um, Thea, yes, and my male character will be Stevenson. Okay, so Thea and Stevenson in Shades of Grey. And I think her first line will be, What are you thinking of? Nothing. <laughs> I knew it. One would think I should have learned by now. He was, he was. Uh, a modernist, but at the same time, he was a old, let us say, type, old colonial type, um, who 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 was rebelling against the, the colonial things and some of the influences of the situation in, in Saint Lucia. For example, the whole issue. If you look at his writings, you see the issue of the Roman Catholic Church. your own. The walls appropriately built to muffle the lurking sounds of the creaking boards beneath your weighted guilt. In this room you will feel safe as you close the world off and all of its traffic. The view outside your window is a distant valley of busy streets weaved into each other. And you have escaped the cold shoulders on the concrete path, the unexpected detours on a well-planned route, the unforgiving heat of the hellish sun, 
you have slithered your way through climbing into your space of solitude leaving behind as much as you have taken in to cast your eyes on fixed images of what once was in this room you will feel safe mastering the art of puppeteer placing the hands of time wherever you wish yet you remain within dusty walls gazing through an open window numb to the touch of the breeze Never mind the pleasure standing near your doorway. Your life won't bend around darkened closets. Soon you will be just like the others. The ones you used to know. Whose lifeless bodies lay locked, frozen, in a box. Just the same. I used to visit him quite quite a lot. We used to, you know, um, uh, in, you know, line together, so to speak. He used to live up at the board. And during those days, uh, one of the, um, you know, one of those buildings of the born, you know, the old um, things. And du during those days, I found him to be uh, very, very reflective. Um, I don't know exactly what he was thinking of. But you could see that he was, you know, in deep thought, always in, in deep thought, uh, and so on. I suppose he must have been, he was writing, of course, during that period of time. And, and perhaps he must have been um, also looking at his future, right? Because, again, in some of the, 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 the writings, you, you, you will see him talking about the educated St. Lucian, not finding his mark when he returns home, kind of thing, you know. Uh, so that kind, of, that kind of thought must have been operating in his mind at the time. Love is a really strange thing. One minute, it's beautiful and you're smiling and you're glowing for years, for days. And then just like that, it can just switch on you and be the coolest thing that you could ever endure. It's really baffling how one small word has so much power. It can induce madness and insanity in someone. I really wonder though, if anyone has ever written a novel that speaks about that kind of love. Because love is not just black and white. It's all the shades that are in between. It's all the shades of gray. So I think it's a very good job that the Cultural Foundation is doing in trying to expose our present generations um, to the life, the social and cultural life, and the interactions with the environment, not only the physical environment, but also the religious environment and the political environment as well. And, and that's, that, that would be... I think a, a very good, um, <clears throat> a very good um, uh, uh, exercise in, in, in social education, if you want to call it that. come as a surprise in a sense to be selected to be a part of it um, and I, I, I remember at first I was like boy I have to I, I it's a long time since I read a novel I have to read this and interpret it <laughs> but 
I am always up to challenges and, 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 and anything musical, you know, that's my passion. So I, I, I like to take the time to, to, to get into the meat of things and, and create something new, go outside of my comfort zone and, and reach deep down within my creative soul to get something that can, you know, resonate with people. And I'm always happy when I go on stage and to see, you know, a good reception and, and see everything just fold out from that little idea to becoming what, what, what people see on stage. It's always a great feeling, so I'm happy to have been selected and, you know, be part of this tribute. All that you've been through Forget all the envy All on the jealousy Just be what you can be Gotta keep yourself up yeah. Cause only you can keep you down See, we don't choose our circumstances I remember the night um, being a very magical one, you know, to share the stage with other very incredible musicians, you know, people like Rufa Faswa, the band, um, everybody was pretty much a unit coming together and, and, and making something magical happen. And I, I remember the crowd being, you know, very, very receptive uh, and like seeing a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, other creatives like myself, you know, um, showing support and, 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 and Adding to this whole celebration is always a great thing. I was actually one of six dancers who was asked to be a part of the tribute to Garth and we actually danced to an excerpt from one of his writings, Nor Any Country, and we were tasked to choreograph a piece to that excerpt basically and put our own movement interpretation to his words. St. Omar raises inevitable questions, not just about Caribbean society, but about the human condition and our ability to address the kind of inbred psychoses which, largely ignored, remain latent until they are amplified to disastrous proportions by the angst and anguish of transplantation and by the triggers of racism, loneliness and inadequacy. It was really modern contemporary with a bit of interpretive movement because we had to dance to his words. And for me, it was not a new experience per se, but almost a new experience because those were dancers that I had never really worked with, with the exception of one young lady named Sadia, but the other four individuals, I had never danced with them before. So it was lovely to be around new creative minds and to be able to mesh our talent and our different choreographing styles to be able to come up with the piece that we did. is too small unless you belong to the right family or are rich enough yes if it was Sydney who had stolen another boy's wallet and had been expelled 
He could always go away to another island or even to Europe. to read it through a number of times and almost fully immerse myself in the piece to basically understand what type of emotion it is that the writer is trying to convey. It's a similar technique that I use when I'm actually choreographing to a regular piece of music. I need to spend time with the piece and really sink into it and then the movements just start to flow and it makes it a bit easier. The entire night, the energy that we had amongst the six of us, it was extremely vibrant and in general, us as dancers, we're very high energy. So even before the show started, we were just trying to psych everybody up, remind ourselves of what it is that we were trying to convey. And then on stage, we were just able to really execute as well as we could have. I think it, it is absolutely necessary that we, we preserve and document our cultural history. Um, I mean, there is no, it is difficult to put a value on it. It is just something which must be done. Every, every country, every, every civilization that of, of note has um, attempted to recognize uh, its persons who have achieved something, especially in the arts. I think the, the show did that justice to, to his works and his memory. Um, we always regard at the icon shows as not just a show for the moment, but um, also something for, for posterity. It's, it's, it's part of the documentation of our culture and our history. So um, it is something that is available for us to share. We're moving on now to the visual arts. Rooted in our forests and branching off into our consciousness and defining our identity. We enter the workshop of Vincent Joseph Udovic through the words of his son, Jalim Udovic. It started when he was about 11 years old um, with visions of dancing men um, you know, or mirages of dancing men in his grandmother's garden. Um, and so he, he felt compelled to interpret these visions, you know, to other people. Because you talk about an era where there was no television. So, so he wanted to illustrate in his own way what he was seeing. He was captivated by these images. So what he did is he converted um, his grandmother's silverware, prized silverware, into sculpting tools. <laughs> um, and, and he carved out a statue, um, you know, but that was much to his chagrin because he, he got um, beaten for that. He got punished for that because you, know, you don't do that to your grandmother's prized silverware. 
and the, the statue he carved out was um, inspired by the story Alibaba and the 45th, right? And, and that's what he carved and it was put in an exhibition um, quite, um, you know, to his um, you know, reluctance because he, he was very shy at the time. And um, it actually won first prize, the national exhibition. And he was only 11 years old. And then he went to um, Trinidad and Tobago um, when he was um, 17 because in Trinidad there was an oil rush there. And um, you know, he continued his um, studies with a, a famed Trinidadian sculptor called Vincente Ricardo. And then further later in life, he went um, to, to Africa, to Nigeria, on a scholarship where he studied traditional and contemporary African art. And when he came back to San Lucia, he merged that with his own style, his own Caribbean identity. Definitely, he was quite fond of a wood called Loye Canel. Now, the story of Loye Canel is quite interesting and embedded in our history, um, in our colonial history. Because Loye Canel um, is sort of like the solution version of, of oak. You know, it's very hard and highly coveted wood when it was during the uh, colonial times. And it, all the trees of Loye Canel, the majority of them, were cut down to build um, wooden pillars for, for the docks and so on because of the special quality of the wood. And the, the um, bed heads of the affluent people, the, the, the beds and so on, and the furniture was carved out of Loye Canel. So, um, you know, by the time he came along and he went into the forest looking for, for, for a variety of wood, he will, he will stumble quite occasionally on the, on the roots and stumps of Loye Canel, you know, and, and in his way, he's, he's also telling a story, you know, of the, of the legacy of that wood. Since there are not many trees left, it's almost, almost cut down to extinction. In a way, he's revitalizing and, you know, bringing new meaning and new essence to, to, to this dead species, almost dead species, you know. So I would say by far, that is his favorite wood. Well, my earliest memories was, um, you know, being um, lulled to sleep by the lullabies of, of, of uh, mallets hitting chisels all Friday night. Because, you know, my, my um, dad was sort of like a, like a man-man. You know, both during the day and during the night, he will, he will work from sun up to sundown and up to midnight. So you'll have the, the, the um, daytime crew of, of apprentices that he will train. And then you have the nighttime crew, which was the more rebellious, you know, guys from 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 the nearby communities, right? Right. So, so this, my earliest memories was being in this camp and being having the privilege to sit on the on the workbench with all of them, feeling like a man at the age of five, and being given my 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 first tool set and my first block of wood. You know, the um, studio was sort of like the um, first art residency in the Caribbean, right? Um, we had artists that was coming in from all parts of the world to uh, spend time with my dad, spend time in the, um, in the studio, and quite often they imparted their um, knowledge on the family, on the, on the many apprentices there. So he went into the restaurant um, um, industry and entertainment industry because we had a restaurant and uh, we, we did live shows and live concerts and so on and um, you know so he was able to draw um, um, quite a bit of uh, clientele into the restaurant and then that that sort of filtered it away into the art studio you know so that was the, the relationship between he being an entrepreneur and an artist, the, the, the end game was always about trying to sell art, <laughs> you know? And, and um, my uh, mom is the unsung hero of, of all of this. She's like the backbone. She's the spine of the, of, of the entire thing. In the, in the 90s, in the late 80s to 90s, when the tourism industry really started to pick up, that's when he sort of got rid of all these other, you know, auxiliary things and, and focused quite a bit, you know, um, almost wholly on his, on his art. I 
mean, I think his legacy lives in me. He lives in all the people that he's impacted, all the people that he has he's trained. You know, he upset he did something that was that was that was very important to, to the um, culture, which is um, you know the the commercialization of, of, of craft and and art. You know, and he and, and he he showed he showed us all that you know that you could survive on your on your passion. You know, especially um, as a as a sculptor, as a as a visual artist, and you could make a, a um, you know beyond a decent a decent living, you could make a very good living. You know, and um, and I believe that what he his work. You know what he what he sought to do was to in, interpret the um, you know, mundane, much like Derek Walcott and Saint Omar did, with the work, into all and, and and give it that that regality that it was um, lacking. Because as Derek Walcott once said, that you know, that the the a mango tree was always inferior to the oak tree, because no one wrote anything about the mango tree, no one, you know. You know, idealize, you know, uh, idealize the uh, mango tree. So, so you find that the, the crop of artists at that time, of, of that era, my, my, my dad, St. Omar's, Derek Walker era, what they sought to do was to, was, was to give dignity to, to the so-called mundane, you know, to, to the mango tree, to the, to the rural people, to the, you know, to the um, St. Lucian folklore. So I think that's his legacy in, in giving us that, that level of dignity and regality, you know, to what was seen as common and insignificant on a, on a global scale. He brought it out there in the most prominent way. He placed emphasis on environment. He placed emphasis on um, people. Um, this, the the harmony, harmonious nature of people, um, there's intricacies that you use, is, um, and you can't, some, sometimes you look at a species, it doesn't matter how small or big it is, you can't seem to understand how a man would take a, piece, a chisel or whatever tools he uses to actually come up with these concepts. I love the unity, the harmony, the nationalism, because um, Sir, Sir Donson St. Omer, a very close friend of, friend of his, and these guys grew up in an era where nationalism was, was a thing. That even though other folks were writing our stories, we were actually creating our stories. So when I see a, 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 a Joseph Ludovic um, piece, I get a symbol of St. Lucia. When I, see, I read a Derek Walker poem, the same thing. A Sudan Sun St. Omer, the flag, paintings, you, you get that sense of St. Lucian identity. So um, I, don't, I don't think even Jalim would come close to his dad. But yeah, <laughs> he'll try, but yeah. But I think when um, one is, um, is appreciated or exalted by the society, that is the crowning achievement of your life's work. You know, so I was very, very elated, you know, when he was made an icon. Because he was always an icon, but, you know, he was, he was made one officially. You know, and, um, and most times people get these things Famously, but he got it when he was alive, so I'm very happy about that. And now to the stage and to a theater icon, Arthur Jakes Jacobs. He was an actor and a visual artist that had a larger than life impact on the theater scene in St. Lucia and the region. He was an actor's actor and a commanding presence on the stage. Good morning, youngster. It's a damp, mournful walk through the forest, isn't it? No, sir. You needn't worry about my authority. Any more than we. These creatures are mine. A big man like you? Who you is? I am Papa Boa. I think his early nurturing, the kind of education that they were taught, really um, shaped 
you know, the kind of intellectual curiosity and the curiosity of the world that was clearly evident in people, um, if, if, in Roddy and Derek and Daddy and their contemporaries at the time. Jakes was, was you know, like as everybody has said, he's, he was so grounded, he was so down to earth, he was so um, real and present. Good morning, youngster. It's a damp, mournful walk through the forest, isn't it? And only the cheep of a bird to warm one. Makes the old bones creak. Bonjour, Vico. My name is Tija. I remember him reading a lot. It's only in hindsight now I realize that he was reading scripts. Um, I remember him going off a lot on, on an evening and coming back really, really late. Um, I do also recall in the, in the late 60s, I have, I have memories of Roddy Walcott um, sort of, you know, uh, um, in the tapestry of our life because now that I think about it, we lived in Rock Hall, Roddy lived in Rock Hall. We lived just a little distance from his house and so um, they interacted a lot, that he moved, went across to, to Roddy's house a lot and they discussed um, not only the scripts, but they also discussed production. And because um, much later on, I found out that my father was also um, functioning in the role of the production manager for quite a number of these plays. The closer times for me, if Afa was, when we were together as actors, I was co-starring, co co uh, um, he was the, one of the major actors. We were the main cast in um, The Haitian Oath of Derek Walcott. Um, and a lot of my development of that character came from his criticism, from, from his support, from his help. I would always go to him, you know, to find out what, what he thinks, you know. And he helped me to develop the character because one of the things I, I, I found out about Cheeks is that he was able to capture, captivate, you know, a character and build it to the extent that you, it, it would appear like what you saw on, 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 on the movies, at the cinema. Don't never see a man on a book dance. Play a night in reading. A bunch of time and some serum People often think that actors are uh, pretenders or you learn lines and you just paint by numbers and you, you, you go here, 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 and you say the line and you leave. But there's a lot going on uh, for an actor, particularly on the stage when you can't stop. You know, it's live. Um, so you have to live it and you have to know it. You have to have an enormous amount of discipline in this craft. And um, apart from that, every actor is different. The part may not change, but the actor might change. So you bring to the part what you can bring. 
And a lot of that has to do with your, your, your self-awareness and your understanding of your craft, but understanding of yourself. And Jake's had all of that and more. I and mean, everybody talks about his voice, which is, I suppose, something God-given. But what he gave himself is his self-awareness. And, and what he brought to a, a part was all of himself, which is all an actor can really do. But it sounds easy, but it's not. You have to become someone else by being yourself. He became so accomplished at it. Clearly, he had, um, he had an inherent um, skill um, for it. But I, you know, nurture has such a role to play in who we eventually become. And I, um, I think my father was a product of a particular era um, of the type of the education that he was exposed to, you know, at the, the CIS, the Castries Intermediate School, or, yeah, um, that he attended and the range of subjects that they were exposed to, he must clearly have had a mind for, um, for, for, for academics um, in the sense that his, his imagination was really peaked. Are mine. A big man like you? Who you is? I am Papa Boa. You know why they call me that? Father of the forest? I don't care. No, you must care. Care for the brown frog that hops in your path. For the blackbird drinking from a pool in the road, Grosjean. Push off you, Papa. What you have with your foot? <laughs> <laughs> please, please, <brother>. please. <laughs> I first met Arthur Jacobs at uh, the Lighthouse Theatre in 1986. I was, what, 22 years old. I had not done much theatre, if any at all. Certainly not in St. Lucia. I had just come back from uh, university and I was hungry to find some footing in the theater. I always knew I wanted to be an actor, but I just didn't know where to find what, how to find it. And I heard about the theater just a stone's throw from my house, from my parents' house in Latok. So I went down there and I met uh, Kendall and Jane, and Jane I knew, of course, uh, for a long time. I knew Kendall from school, and um, they were running a theater. And so they invited me to take part in a production and we did um, Errol John's uh, Moon on a Rainbow Shore. And that's when I first met Jakes. And he was instantly impressive. I mean, I was very young, but I realized that um, you know, I, was, I was full of energy. I always wanted to get up and go. I wanted to run. I wanted to just run. And here was this man so grounded, so focused, so prepared, so so an actor that I was completely taken. I myself thought that war would be so, so neat. You're watching my eyes to see if they will rain. I'll cry, but in the privacy of my own tent. forced me to this decision. Well, all right, I obeyed the rules in peace as I obeyed them in war to destroy the enemy and destroy the past. But through the cannon smoke, the rain, marching over the mulch of corpses, I had one target. I kept Pompey as the pivot of the war, the axle of the revolution. Oh, you commanders, our cause could have come home, but the peasants tremble at us more than they did with the Frenchmen, like canes in expectation of a cutlass. 
let me tell you, the real generals are those who fight the seasons, the rain, the drought, who stand the commanders over the golden corn and arrange the kings and legions. Men like Pompey, men without swords but sights, barefooted men. And you, Jajak, who go straight from the earth. And you, Henry, when all this is finished, treat him as your equal. No, even as your sovereign emperor. Serve him well, waiter, or else I will curse the Haitian earth from my grave that every furrow be dust and every womb in the soil barren. I think the man uh, in Jake's uh, surpassed his... Uh, his era of what may have been expected of an actor, um, not only in what, uh, in w where the, the roles he did and how he did them, but um, in, in, in the um, feedback that he got. I mean, you know, the, the way people respected him. And, uh, and uh, th that's, that's, some, that's something that you, you simply can't take away from him. I, I, I recall Mrs. Wynne's um, remarks at uh, my father's funeral when she was making the point that the work and the life and the contributions of our artistic people are, they are artifacts of our history. And so the generation that's coming need to be steeped in, in they, need, they need to be rooted, you know, by these icons before them. These icons need to be the roots of the, the identity because these are the people that shape the pride of the, the, the nation um, in its various dimensions, whether it be in theater, whether it be in literature, whether it be in politics. And so we need to give equal place to our creative, um, forebears, our, our creative front runners, as we do to our politicians. Because, you know, we well know that art interprets life, life reflects art, that kind of way. His legacy is left for those of us who know him to, to, to push it. Um, whatever is, 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 is there that, that we have, we can keep it there so we can keep that, that, that flame booming so people would know that there is talent. And one, one, that's one other thing I think that, that he may have contributed very much into, in that we then felt that, oh no, theatre was not just um, what we saw in the movies. There was talent in St. Lucia. He, he, he gave us that assurance. I, you know, I think that St. Lucians can do it. Can do it too, you know. And finally, we dance. From folk to modern and into the future, Virginia Alexander defined dance. Her influence is generational. You know, Virgie would walk into a room and you'd see her. And I think I put, I tied my head just for to ode to her today um, because she always had this like head wrap on. I hardly ever saw her in a skirt. It was always pants. Um, just this upright um, person who just loved us unconditionally and allowed us to be ourselves.
kind lady. She was really sweet and she was all for us and our development. The dancers in Lesopho all loved Virgie. Virgie was like a mother to them. Virgie loved the development of young people. Virgie loved sharing the art form. From a very, very early age, we were part of what she was doing. When she had performances, we were the last to leave with her. When she was making costumes at home, we were there looking. When she was listening to all the music for the La Wars and La Marguerite, we were listening as well. So it was a very integral part of our childhood and growing up. I think um, one of the things she mentioned to me was meeting Pat Charles and what an influence that was. I think she recognized her from an early stage in her life as being something special, somebody who had something special to offer to dance. And I think throughout her career, she did give that special place to Patricia Charles um, as being a mentor to her. But I noticed also throughout her life, she went back to Labry, which was the village where she was born. And there was something about Labry, the PI people and their dancing. There was something about that that really struck a chord with her. She would give us the traditional St. Lucian dances. She would even bring Uncle Frank Norville to come and teach us the songs. Uh, the quadrille, his son, Chris, would come and be our partner and um, teach us the dances of our culture. So she was very big on that. My mother remembers very fondly working on Banjo Man, Roderick Walcott, and doing these productions, Chasson Marianne and others. So she really, she really enjoyed the full diversity of St. Lucian culture. I think when we talk about people in culture and my mother, they are not alone, they are with others. So Joyce Ogis, Frank Novel, I remember very well, Sesen, all of these people, Keton, some of them, most of them have gone now, but I remember them as names, Teresa Hall, that was very much part and parcel of my mother's life. It's opening night. If you don't get it together, you'll really have something to worry about. I was given the task to do the exhibition and it was, for me, it was one of the most beautiful things I have done because the research on dance, like I said, in, in terms of bringing that legacy forefront, the research on dance for me was, was great because I had that information already. <laughs> My mother's job was not behind a desk. She came in, she, she did everything she had to do and she was straight out of the door to the schools, going to them to go through the La Wars and La Magri. She was also 
dealing with them a lot in the independence youth rallies. You'll remember that youth rallies had a very important segment, which was about singing and dancing and really showcasing the cultural art forms in St. Lucia. So she was very passionate about what the youth could do to preserve and develop our cultural art forms, including dance. While she was the um, dance officer at the Cultural Development Foundation, she used me a lot in the schools in helping me preparing the National Youth Rally. So I did a lot of choreography with her um, and that helped propel part of my dance career. Beyond this place of wrath and tears Growing up um, in, Saint, in a St. Lucian society, you find that um, there are not many male dancers and at the time they were just like about three or four of us dancers. And there were times that a lot of us wanted to give up because of the stigma behind male dancers. But with that mother figure of Virginia Alexander, she gave us the hope. She gave us the, um, the strength to continue that when she have a group of 50 girls, you just have two boys. So she was that mother figure that when everybody else had the stigma about the male dancer, she was there to guide us and coach us and give us the, the strength and the energy to continue dancing. Most times, Virgie didn't teach us. There was always somebody teaching the classes. Um, but she was always physically there. Virgie would not leave the room until classes were over. And I can just hear her say, extend your arms. Make sure these extensions are good. Hold yourself properly. And posture was everything for her. So these little um, nuggets just stay buried in your subconscious, I think. So she had a great input in what was happening within the classes. Um, she was not strict at all, even if she was not the dance teacher. But what she always wanted from us, that our work as a dancer, that we were excellent. Once I remember we were sort of relaxing and um, <laughs> this woman looked at us and said, you see, that is why you guys will never make it to Broadway. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I think the shock and the looks on our faces, just, you know, we couldn't believe she said that. And anytime there was somebody sort of slacking or, you know, not doing what they're supposed to do, you know, we would quote her like, yeah, that's why you'll never make it to Broadway. You know, we had the last laugh though because we had one of our dancers, Darcel, who made it to Broadway, so whatever. <laughs> she was all about the dance. She was all about the hard work. And when we talk about icons, it's, it's more than an accolade. It's actually recognizing the people who just work very hard behind the scenes. group Les Enfants because Les Enfants was so good to me when I was a young girl that everything that she's taught me I'm passing it on to the next generation and even though these children are not from St. Lucia um, they feel like they're St. Lucians they wear the flag they sing the songs She really pushed everybody and anybody who wanted to be part 
of the dance community in St. Lucia. She was a very hardworking person, very creative, very innovative. Her legacy has spanned more than St. Lucia. It's branched out, you know, because as I said, there's a laser fun in Chicago. Um, we have Tanya Isaac, who has been a professor in dance at university. <laughs> Virgie was a very spiritual person. I don't know how many people knew that. I have a hymnal with me every time I go to church and I must remember Virgie because she gave it to me and the inscription is it, in it said, um, Sonia, keep on praying. I wonder why no one ever let me know how difficult my life had been. Memory washes it all clean, surrounded by brown skin, hot earth, hot sun, clear water, and so much music. Everybody, I think, has walked away with um, confidence, um, has walked away with, you know, feeling self-assured and knowing who they are and, and knowing what their, their true voice is in whatever field or career, um, whether they're a mom, um, you know, taking care of their children, whatever it is. She instilled um, discipline. She, in, you know, helped us to find our true voices. For me, it's very, very important that we remember those who have contributed to any development of our country. And Virgie had done quite a bit of work. Her legacy was just enough. It was enough for all of us that passed through to have that opportunity for us to sit with her at that icon series, you know, and remember her because her whole life was dance, her whole life was teaching. So when CDF made that decision, to do that icon series, I series for her, it's really it was it was beautiful. I, I it's something I won't forget. <laughs> I think the experience was one that Virgie would have been proud of. Um, Tanya was here, Shakina was here, um, Nicole was here. These are all dancers that are overseas. Um, Dasa couldn't make it because she's in the Lion King and she couldn't get time off. Um, but most of the old dancers who actually danced with. Auntie Virgie and friends of Laser Fur were part of this production, which for me was a remarkable tribute to a woman. We sang and we, um, I believe we lit candles and we danced around a photo of her. And then we came out of the uh, choreography to dance the entire dance with drums. I didn't know whether to scream, to cry, to, 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 to laugh all the way through, but it was just so, so fantastic to see um, the dancers on stage paying tribute to Virgie. It was, you know, all the dignitaries who attended. Her daughter Che came from England to be there. Her children were there. It was unforgettable.
I think our generation lacks the quiet endurance gene. We absolutely thrive on melodrama. The people who sacrifice and integrate their love and vocation so much into their world that their families and every, every aspect of their life is given up to the art. And that was what I think was the tribute to my mother, that she really sacrificed and gave everything to dance to the culture of St. Lucia. And she, you know, she would do it in a hundred lifetimes in the very same way. As we close tonight, we urge every one of you, whether you're watching us from the Rash in Fossa Jacques or Dubai, we want you to remember the cultural icons celebrated tonight. They've left us a body of work that reminds us that we are proud of our cultural heritage. And we want you to remember that there are many more icons to be celebrated, many to be nurtured and encouraged. Many are still tiny thoughts. Give them the space, the hope and support to achieve greatness and to document and entertain for generations to come. This has been a night to remember. Aye, aye, aye.